Um, like Elliot said, my name is Laura Dorley, and I'm a campaign organizer with Environment Maine. Um, Environment Maine is a statewide citizen-funded environmental organizing and advocacy orga organization um, with over 22,000 members and supporters across the state. Um, and I'm going to kick it off with a few words about why we're here today um, and run through our program. Um, but before that, uh, a few thank yous are in order. I want to start off by thanking our honored speakers um, here today. Um, David Hart, David Miller, Connie Cross, our director Taryn Hallweaver, and Senator Angus King um, for you know leading the discussion this afternoon. I also want to give a big thank you to our co-sponsors of the event um, that helped to, to make this event happen. Um, the Lakes Environmental Association, Lunaco Land Trust, um, the Maine Lake Society, Maine Rivers, Trout Unlimited, and the Sebago Lake Anglers Association. Um, I also want to um, give a thank you for the Naples, to the Naples Town, Town Hall um, for hosting us today. Um, and finally, um, a thank you to the Holy Donut and Rosemont Bakery <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts for giving us top coffee and treats uh, this afternoon. <laughs> now, who here enjoys ice fishing? Show of hands, great. Um, what about snowmobiling? Skiing? Great. Um, and any other winter sports I missed? Snowshoeing. Snowshoeing. Oh, sure. <laughs> There's a lot out there. Yeah. Bob sledding. Bob sledding. Great. Ice skating. That's a great one. Um, all right. So these three sports, uh, or these sports, have three things in common. Um, they all depend on uh, cold winter. Um, they're part of our heritage here in Maine, and they are all threatened by climate change. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, we all care about the environment here in our state, um, maybe for slightly different reasons, but we all want to see it protected. Climate change is a big issue. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, and it's an issue that is going to take some serious problem solving and serious political will um, to prevent the worst impacts. Um, and so that is what we're going to discuss today. Um, we're going to talk about the science of how climate change is affecting the state of Maine, um, specifically and including and especially our winter heritage and our fish populations. What solutions are available to us and how we can raise our voices to take action. So here's how our program is gonna work. Um, our panelists will each have five minutes to talk um, about what they're seeing and um, their role here today. Um, and we're going to be keeping it to the strict time limit so that there's time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, everyone see Morgan in the front? Morgan, give a quick wave. Um, Morgan Rogers is our campaigns director with Environment Maine. Um, Morgan, make an intimidating face. <laughs> um, that face is the one that's going to keep us on track today. Morgan's going to be managing the time and making sure that our program uh, flows well. Um, and after each of the panelists present, um, we'll open it up for questions. Um, and we'll keep that running smoothly, too, so that everyone who wants to get a question asked um, has time. Um, let's see. And then at the end of the program, we are going to take on a logistical feat and get a big group photo with Senator King. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to our speakers, starting with David Hart. So we just need to bring up the, you're going to have to turn your head, I hope you don't get a stiff neck from this, but I'm going to show a few photos, about eight or nine, not much. Um, so I'm a scientist, uh, and I'm going to give a talk about some of the science, but it's really short, and it's right about here where we sit today. Um, but I'm also at halfway through going to take off my science hat and tell you how I feel about this as a Mainer, as a parent, and as a grandparent. So let me start here. So. What do we know? Uh, scientists aren't supposed to tell people what to do. That's not our job. But we feel a real obligation to tell you what we know. That's the first half where I'll be the scientist. This is a picture of up to 200 years of uh, change in ice outdates in Maine lakes. And you can see on there, on the, basically the lowest one over to the right, you'll see Sebago Lake, where we are today. And I can tell you that between the early 1800s when records began until um, not quite up to the present date but around the turn of the century, uh, 2000, that the ice out date has moved forward earlier in the year by about a month. So 
like it might even be increasing over the last few decades. Then. So this is something that many people have seen, but of course nobody's been around for 200 years to watch it. The longer we go, the more impressive some of these changes are. Obviously, it has huge impact on the kind of things that people raise their hand to say they enjoy. Why is this happening? The air temperatures are rising. These are data from Maine. Um, you can look in other parts of the planet. As you well know, this doesn't happen every year. We're having a cold winter. It varies a lot from year to year. It's not until you look over a longer time period that you really see these trends jump out at you. What else does this do? Well, we're also seeing increases in extreme flooding. This is a, a, a four inch, the number of four inch rainfalls in 24 hours per decade going back to the 60s, so a little over 50 years, and they're going up a lot. Now this is Durham, New Hampshire from some colleagues in, at the University of New Hampshire. I can, uh, later on I can show you data for many places in Maine, similar things are happening in most of the spots where people have made these measures. And of course, if you're on the coast, uh, you tend to be worried about sea level rise. In Portland, uh, where of course the Patriot State storm in 2007 was uh, a real problem, uh, we've seen about <coughs> a half foot of sea level rise over the last century or so. So, a uh, pretty big deal. And again, might be accelerate, might be going up even more than that in the future. Okay, so that is some of what the science that's being done. Not by myself so much, but by colleagues at the University of Maine, at the University of New Hampshire, and all over the world can show similar patterns like this. But let me take off my science hat and put on my hat as a concerned citizen. And it turns out one of the ways I look at these issues is not just thinking about how the world should be today, but what kind of world we're going to leave for your kids, your grandkids, your friends' kids, who knows. These are my two granddaughters, uh, Anita and Carolyn last summer at the Bangor State Fair. Um, they've got a big uh, life ahead of them, uh, and we have an obligation to think about the future that, that uh, they're going to face. So let me tell you a little metaphor about this. So it's a little bit like when I put my granddaughters in the car, put them in their car seat, their car seats are buckled up tight, we drive where we're driving, and you have to think about how fast you're going to drive and whether there are problems ahead. The way we've been em emitting greenhouse gases over many decades is a little bit like putting your pedal to the metal. You're going fast, you think this is okay, everything looks okay up ahead, no problems, and in any case I'll be able to step on the brakes if I see a problem. So that's kind of a metaphor, but not exactly. About a month and a half ago, not far from where I live on I-95, I live in Winterport, the Penobscot River, I-95, traffic headed north on 95 towards Bangor. Yeah. People driving with a bit of snow blowing, not a big drift, um, not great conditions, coming around the bend, can't see too far, pedal to the metal. Worst mm -hmm. traffic accident in Maine's history. It's a miracle that no one died. This uh, headline said 75 car pile up more than 100 cars. I had friends barely missed uh, that collision just behind it. Um, but speed definitely contributed to this. So we live this in our daily lives. How prepared are we for the problems that lie ahead and what kind of action are we going to take? Now, I told you my story as a parent and as a grandparent, but let me tell you, the group that I lead has been studying this and looking at main attitudes, and I think they're quite interesting. We did a survey all across the state, getting a general sample of Mainers, asking them, uh, the, saying the statement, it is my responsibility to help solve environmental problems, and asking whether they agree with that or don't agree across this scale. Over two-thirds agree or strongly agree that that's their responsibility. So this isn't just me. This is Mainers in general saying, we are the stewards of our environment, and we're responsible for what we leave to future generations. I think that's an important, uh, that, that's Maynard speaking, and I think this uh, speaks volumes about how to deal with the current climate change problem. I just want to finally say that the center I lead, named after Sandra Mitchell, of the Center for Sustainability Solutions, we got most of our, our ideas for the work we're doing through a conversation with Senator King way back in about February of 2007. 
He Skyped with us, or the equivalent of Skype on his iMac from his kitchen in Brunswick for a couple hours. And uh, at the end of it, I was glad because we were telling him we we're going to try to work on these issues. And he said, gee, I just wish I'd had something like this when I was governor. Well, Senator, you do have something like this. We're in business. So thank you. And thank you. Um, and next we'll have David Miller. So I'm uh, the president of Trout Unli Sebago Trout Unlimited, uh, based here in southern Maine. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, our expert on native brook trout and climate change, Jeff Reardon, whom some of you may know, could not be here, so I'm second string filling in. I'm going to do my best to represent him well. Uh, I want to start with uh, just a story. You know, most of you can probably remember the first fish that you caught when you were young. <laughs> I certainly do. It was a tiny little brook trout from a little stream in the White Mountains. And you know, I have fond memories of that. But what really sticks with me more than any other memory about fishing is taking my son into mm -hmm. the back country outside of Yellowstone uh, the year he got out of college. And he had his first big fishing day. Uh, we bushwhacked through some grizzly country down to this tiny little stream and had a banner day catching wild native cutthroat. And what I remember most is helping him take the hook out of his first cutthroat that he caught. And we were both just looking at it, and we could not believe how beautiful the fish was in the midst of just a beautiful place. That was Wyoming. Wyoming is beautiful. It does not really have anything on Maine. Maine is beautiful, and the native brook trout is unbelievable. It's just a gorgeous fish. So I think what I really want to emphasize in the short time I have today is that... Um, the, the brook trout, the native wild brook trout here in Maine, it's a state treasure that we need to save. Beyond being a symbol, it's also a canary in the, in the coal mine. It's a great indicator of overall aquatic health. So it deserves attention. If we can save the brook trout, we do a lot for the entire environment. I'm not an ice fisherman, but I am a, an avid fly fisherman. And in the, in the northeast especially, the brook trout is the prize fish. We are the last stronghold for the brook trout in the, in the United States. Could you go to the next uh, yeah. slide? You'll see that the, originally the range stretched all the way down to northern Georgia along the Appalachian chain. There's still a few tiny little remnant populations in north Georgia, supposedly. But in general, the trout have retreated, been pushed back into the northeast. Maine is the epicenter. We have more healthy brook trout water than anybody else by far and more intact watershed than anyone else. Uh, next slide. So the brook trout is under threat. Not even counting climate change. There's all, it's under all kinds of threats from interruptions in streams so they cannot uh, migrate naturally. Brook trout and other cold water fish, they need to have free passage so especially during this hotter summers they can find deeper shaded pools to survive the hot weather in. So fra fragmentation of, of their streams is a major issue. Disease brought in by invasive species is a big issue around the country. It is here in Maine for the brook trout. And uh, invasive species to compete directly with wild fish, as in smallmouth bass is probably the most well-known here in Maine. So that's just some of what the brook trout is dealing with now. <clears throat> Climate change is adding insult to injury. Because as the climate continues to warm, uh, the water is going to get warmer. They, they will need more and better passage to find safer places to stay through the summer, or they just won't make it here. Um, so what can we do? And uh, what Sebago to you and many other conservation groups are focusing on in Maine, dam removal, culvert replacement, and uh, Steve Hines is our conservation director here involved in many, many projects around southern Maine and the state uh, around dam removal and culvert, culvert replacement to open up, open up the uh, passageways. So we can mitigate. We can mitigate for climate change, and we need to. That's one thing. I'm here to encourage us to actually get to the root problem if we can, which, as David mentioned, is the emission of greenhouse gases. So whatever we can do to lower our carbon footprint is going to get us some traction in addition to everything else we need to do. So we can throw up our hands and say we can't do anything about climate change. That's one option. And we can't focus on the doom and gloom. So part of what I'm here to say is 
do what you can do. That's what we try to do. We try to do that as best we can in Southern Maine. I want to encourage all, you, all of you to find your own ways to do that. So thank you very much. All right, and um, I'll now turn it over to Connie Cross to talk about her experience living in this area. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of unfamiliar faces. <coughs> I am neither a scientist or a fisherman. <laughs> What I am is an observer. I've lived in Maine since the early 70s and here since 1950. So that's a long, long time and I've seen a lot of changes. Let me talk a little bit about fishing, the qualifications of which um, are slim to none in my case. Um, for the last, oh, I don't know, 10 or more years, my good friend Elliot Stanley and his wife and advi have invited my husband and me to go smelt fishing up in Bodenham. And it used to be we would go and catch a lot of fish. There was one year when Elliot challenged us to catch as many fish as my husband was old. And we walked out of there with over 70 fish. Last year we caught one. One fish. We paid $60 for that shack, so that was a very expensive fish. <laughs> Um, and we were happy to catch it because we had a good time drinking wine, telling terrible stories, dirty jokes, eating chili, and having a good time. Away but it still, <laughs> <laughs> but it still was a pretty pricey fish. So we've seen some changes. And a few years ago, they had to pull the shacks on the Cadence River in very early because the ice was so thin. So things, things have changed over the last several years. I've noticed a lot of changes where I live on Panther Pond over in Raymond. In the last couple of summers, we've had rainstorms so intense, and I think David talked about that, that our long dirt road, it's, a, it's about a mile into our cottage, has washed out so badly that it's taken a lot of mitigation to get that road back in driving shape. And we don't expect this to, to change. Uh, we know that that road is going to wash out now almost every summer. So we're trying to figure out ways to mitigate that kind of damage and to mitigate the, the effects of that. And one of the effects of, of washouts on roads is that all of that dirt um, has phosphorus attached to it. And we know from our good friends at the Lakes Environmental Association that when that stuff reaches a lake, it promotes the growth of algae. And this is another change I've seen in my wonderful Lake Panther Pond over the last several years. I would say in the last four to five, we have seen explosive growths of an algae called Gliotrichia. It's a little round fuzzy ball. If you, any of you live on the lakes in the summer, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, the scientists, and I, again, I'm not a scientist, and um, I don't know the reason for the gliotrichia expansion, except that when lakes are losing their ice much earlier in the season, there's that much more sunlight. And my suspicion is that that's feeding the growth of algae. Just as on the Cadence River, um, I'm not a scientist. I don't know why there are fewer smelt. But there was an article in the Portland paper suggesting that climate change perhaps was affecting, because of the warmer waters, the smelt coming up into the into the rivers of Maine. And that's going to have effect on larger fisheries, bigger fish that people are, are trying to catch, um, and which is an important part of our economy here in Maine. So recreationally, I think we're having you know, some effects that are, are being seen on the lakes and on the ocean. And um, you know, I really wanted to pass my Maine on to my grandchildren. And I'm <laughs> becoming increasingly fearful that my Maine is not going to be the Maine that they get. Um, so I think whatever we can do, um, we should try to do. Whether it's just small things, whether it's um, promoting the uh, people like Ms. Senator King who are going to fight for us in, in, in the Senate, I think that's, those things are important. Um, and I'll now turn it over to Dr. Kelly. 
it over to our director at Environment Maine, Taryn Hallweaver. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Taryn Hallweaver. I'm the director of Environment Maine, and I am so appreciative of our speakers for really bringing this issue to a home level here in Maine. For a number of years, um, the, the poster child for global warming was a polar bear. And I enjoy charismatic megafauna as much as the next person, but I always had a little bit of an issue with polar bears as the poster child of climate change, because for most people, polar bears are pretty far away from their own reality. And when I think about climate change, I do think about mega droughts in California and low-lying nations in the Pacific Ocean that are someday going to be underwater. But first, I think about the friends who I grew up with in Yarmouth who lobster and who are hauling in seahorses in their traps and really worried about the future. And I think about when I was a kid in Range Lake, flipping to the back of the phone book and looking at all the ice out dates from the 1800s onward. Mm. And it doesn't actually, you don't need to be a climate scientist to see the, <laughs> to see the trends and that's, ice out was a big part of the culture and, and is and I think about our changing traditions. So I'm going to talk about three things. One is what's happening nationally on the climate change front. Um, talk about the Clean Power Plan, which is the, the biggest thing the United States has ever done to tackle climate change. Um, I'm going to talk about how well positioned Maine is and how, in fact, Maine tackling climate change, I believe, can be the next big chapter in our state's history. So uh, first off, climate change is a problem of such magnitude that as many of our speakers have touched upon, we have to act individually, we have to act at the state level, and we have to act federally. Uh, and we try to think about where can we get the biggest bang for our buck. And individual actions are important. Too much emphasis on individual actions tends to shift responsibility away from the, the, biggest, um, the biggest actors. So one example of this is that Coca-Cola, the, the corporation, coined the term litter bug. Everyone's heard of the term litter bug before. And, and that did a lot, I think, mentally for us to, sh to shift responsibility away from who was manufacturing a disposable and wasteful product onto the individual consumer. And it's not to say that individual actions aren't important because they, they are, and we absolutely all have a responsibility. But we must act at the state level, and we must act at the federal level as well. So what's going on nationally right now is the Clean Power Plan. And a little bit of background on this. Since the 1970s, uh, when our country passed the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency has limited uh, the amount of mercury and arsenic and soot that could be polluted, known toxins that make people sick. And by and large, this has been very effective, and our air is much cleaner now than it used to be. And in the 2000s, the Supreme Court told the EPA that they should be regulating carbon dioxide the exact same way they regulate mercury and soot and arsenic. And it had become very clear that global warming was bad for public health. So it's 2015, and we currently have zero limits on carbon dioxide. None, zip, zilch. Uh, power plants are the biggest source of global warming pollution in the United States. They account for about 40%, and they can pollute an unlimited amount of carbon dioxide. And given all that we know about global climate change and its impacts on Maine and what we have to do to drastically reduce our use of carbon, this is uh, pretty insane. So the EPA is proposing a new set of rules that will fairly significantly lower the amount of carbon that power plants emit. This is going after the big guys, this is the job of the federal government, and it's not going to solve the whole problem, but it's a really significant first step. And here in Maine, we're very, very well positioned for the Clean Power Plan because we've been participating in a regional program called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, REGI for short, since 2009. And it's been very successful. It's basically a win-win-win. Carbon pollution's been down regionally 30%. It's the first cap and trade program in the country. And then the revenues are taken and reinvested in energy efficiency and clean energy initiatives. So carbon pollution's down. Um, our proceeds have topped 60 million in Maine, and we've saved over 250 million dollars in energy costs for Mainers. So not only is Maine well equipped, and we'll have to do very little, if you know, nothing, to comply with the new rules, but we can actually lead because we can say, "Look at Reggie, this has worked. This has been really effective," and we can actually do it nationwide. And then, just taking a little bit of a step back from the Clean Power Plan and Reggie, I, I, Maine 
is facing, as everyone in this room knows, significant problems when we think about traditional economic indicators. We're an aging state. We're a state that is consistently ranking at the bottom nationally for economic growth. We're supposedly clinging to the past. And as someone who's from Maine and moved back here and I'm pretty set on being here, I really reject that. And I see a state that's really <coughs> creative and entrepreneurial and really well poised to tackle this problem. And I think about the farmers and producers who are really revolutionizing the way that we're growing and transporting and consuming food in our state. And I think about our tourism economy and how creative it is that we bring all these people in to not only enjoy our natural resources but pay for it and somehow they never even hear about all the things we say behind their back. That's kind of creative. Um, I think about the University of Maine's really leading climate change program and renewable energy businesses that are helping individuals and other businesses break their dependence in oil and gas. And what I would love to see is our state really tackle this problem head on and think about how do we build on our existing success and build our resiliency. Make sure we're ready to face storms and floods, prepare for changing seasons, update our aging infrastructure, shift to 21st century technology. I think we can put a lot of people to work. We can make a really big difference, and I think we can build community in the process. So I want to thank Senator King for all of his leadership on climate change and encourage him and the rest of our federal delegation to not only support the Clean Power Plan and make sure there are no delays and we implement it right away, but also to recognize along with our state leaders and everyone in this room the tremendous opportunity I do believe we have in tackling this problem and coming out better on the other side. And I want to encourage everyone in this room to really think about how do we raise the voices of impacted communities. Global warming is more than just about polar bears. It's more than just about Prius drivers. We have a lot of snowmobile riders in here. <laughs> Maybe some Prius drivers too, but it's about raising unlikely voices. So I encourage everyone to think about that, and hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss a little bit in the Q&A. Um, thank you. Thank you, Taryn, and I'll turn it over to Senator King. Thank you. Um, I, I came at this, I think, like a lot of people in this room, as somebody who was uh, listening, skeptical, didn't really know a lot about it. And I saw a little graph uh, in a newspaper about five years ago that uh, really got my attention. And uh, I don't have it on the big screen, but I, I have a little card. The graph, to me, told me uh, everything I needed to know about climate change. And I, so I had it put on a little card, which I hand to my friends in Washington from time to time, the ones who, you know, say nothing's happening. Um, the snowball throwers? Yeah, the guy, well, I did actually hand him one. Um, anyway, it's, it's a little hard to see, but what, what's, what you're looking at is a million years of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what you see is a, a lot of ups and downs. People say, well, it varies naturally. And it does. It varies from about 180 parts per million to close to 300 over the last 999,000 years. Over here, this line is about 1860. And you see what happens in 1860. It starts up, and it gets to, a, right now, it's at 400 parts. In other words, it's been at, the highest it's been for the last million years is 300. Now it's at 400. The last time it was at 400 was 3 million years ago, and the oceans were 50 feet higher. Now, that, this graph to me, and, it, and this really, this is what made up my mind. This is science. This is from the ice cores that, that they have up in Orono and that they have in Greenland and that they've gotten from around the world. And these are just, this is just what the numbers are. So to me, this answers two of the questions. One. Is something happening? Yes. Two, do people have something to do with it? It's, to me, it's too much of a coincidence that this starts upward on that sharp incline when we started burning coal and then later oil in large quantities all over the world. And, and there ha I don't know about you, but I haven't noticed a big outbreak of volcanoes in the last hundred years. Every now and then we have one, but not anything like history has had in, in the past. So this, to me, says, A, something's happening, B, people have something to do with it. The other side of the card is 
the relationship between CO2 and temperature over the last million years. And if you, 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 I'll be glad to leave some of these, but what you see is almost an exact correlation. CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. And it just jumps around. And now we're at, we're at this point on the graph, off the scale, in terms of, number, of, point, of percent of CO2 in the atmosphere. I, I have what almost amount, I guess it would be the political equivalent of a sacred responsibility on this. You know why? I'm sitting in Edmund Muskie's United States Senate seat. And Edmund Muskie was one of the most courageous and brilliant political leaders of the 20th century. And he used to, he, he, he a, a, an amazing fact, the first Clean Air Act, one of the most comprehensive and far-reaching pieces of legislation passed in the 20th century passed the United States Senate unanimously. Can you imagine the United States Senate passing anything unanimously today? <laughs> we can't agree on the time of day. But it was a tribute to Muskie's leadership, and he used to talk around Maine and use a globe, you know, like we always have in our classroom, and the globe is covered with a little uh, coating of shellac, you know, to make it smooth and shiny. That coating of shellac on the globe in your library is proportional to the thickness of the actual atmosphere around the planet Earth. It's very thin. And the, the, the environmental system that we all live in is very fragile, and two or three degrees is a big deal to the brook trout and to the salmon and to the lobsters and to the maple trees, and to the moose. And so this is, I don't view this as some kind of altruistic thing. This is just practical stuff that our lives are going to be changed by it. And as, as the doctor said, this is a, really about our kids. And I'll, I'll end with this. My philosophy of, envir of the environment can be summed up in a real simple image. It, I call it the main rototiller rule. And the main rototiller rule is if you borrow your neighbor's rototiller in the spring, you give it back to them in as good a shape as you found it with a full tank of gas. That's the main way. That's who we are. The planet is on loan to us. We don't own it. It's on loan to us. It belongs to our kids and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren for generations and generations, and we don't have any right to mess it up and give it back to them in, in worse shape than we got it. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, and it doesn't, doesn't mean it's going to be painless or inexpensive. It's something we have to attend to. Now, what makes it really complicated politically is America can't solve this problem by itself. This is a worldwide problem. And I can't sit down there in Washington and say people in Maine should pay more for their gasoline if nothing's happening in China or India. This has to be a global effort because we can do everything in the world. It's like Maine's, we used to have air ozone alerts in Maine, and we learned through the science that we could shut down every automobile and every factory in Maine, but the air coming from Ohio and Pennsylvania still gave us a violation in Cape Elizabeth. So we're combined, we, we are in this together with the rest of the world, and I think it's, a, it's an urgent priority uh, because it's the right thing to do for our kids, and it's the right thing to do uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, place that uh, the good Lord gave us to to, to live in and, and to, to fish for brook trout and, uh, to enjoy. So uh, that's, that's my message, and um, I, I just, and, and I, I, I just said finally, didn't I? Just, my wife says I say finally too much. It gets <laughs> people's hopes up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... What I wanted to end with is, for the life of me, and I really, I'm being sincere about this, I cannot figure out how this became a partisan issue. This is science. We don't debate in Washington that light goes 186,000 miles a second. You know, there's not a Republican or Democratic position on the boiling temperature of water. This is science. And to me, he says, not yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but. I think we've somehow got to get beyond that, that they're not winners and losers here and Democrats and Republicans, but, but this is, a, 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 I think, an issue that, that we really ought to, we just got to, you know, 
the no, it's the numbers. Uh, and I, I just hope we can get beyond that. And I think, I, I think there's some, there's some good, there are lots of good people in Washington, and I, I believe that it's not going to take much. It'll take one or two people who say, yeah, this is the science, and I think there are a lot of people that are ready to, to break on this issue. So um, that's, that's my message, and I appreciate your uh, and what, Do you want to tell them about the abrupt climate change issue? We think of climate as happening in over hundreds and thousands of years. Their research indicates it happens in decades. Mm -hmm. Is that that's yeah, that's right? And I, I find that pretty scary. In other words, there's a tipping point. The ice age has started in a matter of decades. It wasn't, you know, ten thousand years. And by the way, if you don't think things change right where we're sitting, there was two miles of ice ten thousand years ago. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, thank you, Senator King, and thanks to all of our panelists. Um, we now have 10 minutes um, to take questions from you all. China right now has got 22 nuclear reactors, 26 running, 22 Sorry, being that's, built now. That's to cut you off. And it's going to double in a decade. <laughs> Why can't we do that? I think the biggest issue is cost. We'll discuss it later. It's a, no, it's a question, I, well, you're, you're more of an expert on I, than I am, but there's, it's a very, uh, the construction itself is very expensive, and it's, I can't remember, $5,000 a kilowatt, as I recall, in that range. Uh, to give a comparison, wind is about 2000 and gas is $500, uh, so it's, it's just an expensive technology. And uh, it requires, uh, I, my friend and I are going to end up debating this, I can see it coming, but uh, it's, it's very heavily subsidized in the sense that there's a, a federal law that essentially insures nuclear power plants because they couldn't be insured through the regular insurance, the Price-Anderson Act, which amounts to a very large subsidy. So it's, it's and, but on the other hand, it's, it's clean and it doesn't uh, pollute. It's a question of, there, is, there are concerns about safety and uh, it's, it's, my, I've done energy for the last 35 years. The one thing I can tell you for sure is there's no free lunch. <laughs> Every form of energy has costs and benefits. And uh, nuclear is, is, is one of those. And of course, we had a nuclear plant in Maine that, that closed about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, it's certainly, when it's operating and everything is good, it's, it's the cheapest to produce, to operate, but it's a high capital cost. That's the, that's the issue. It's hard not to note with the, the, the nuclear discussion that 29 years ago in this town, the Department of Energy proposed a high level nuclear waste dump. And this was going to be the largest um, public works project in, in human history. And because they were looking for, for granite formations, we were chosen. And one question was, well, what happens if the best granite formation is right under Long Lake? And they very matter-of-factly said, we'll drain it. Oh, no. It was 2,000 acres that they were going to create. The hole to get down to the 2,000 acres was a half a mile across. And the, the citizens of this area just went completely bonkers about this. And, and I, in, the, in the end, I think, think we, we really prevail in showing that, that the, the disposal of the waste is the real issue. So we can, we can debate this later. My purpose is there are a couple of themes that came up today. One is science, and the other is tipping points. And LEA was formed in Naples, Maine 45 years ago. We test more lakes than anyone in the state of Maine. And for many, many years, we felt rather complacent about the situation. Um, and, and about five or six years ago, we began to look into the, the science, and especially in Maine, that was occurring for, for, for lake protection and understanding those systems, and really found out that there was reason for alarm. So one thing that we, we have done, and, and in fact, right now, we're building the Maine Lake Science Center in Bridgeton. The purpose of this is to provide researcher housing, a conference center, workspace, an education center for the thousand plus kids that we deal with every year in the school systems because we need to find out the answers. Where are the tipping points for our lakes? We frankly don't know that. And there's such an enormous, I'll slide that over here. There are <laughs> such an enormous <laughs> economic um, engine for the state of Maine and they're so very fragile and we just don't understand enough about them. And I'll close with the, a little photo here. This is from the Belgrade Lakes. And this is really a pretty astonishing situation because you have two lakes side by side. One is totally pea green, one looks healthy. Now this is the kind of 
question we have to answer. Why is this happening? Or we're going to see more and more Pea Green Lake. So I invite you to come visit LEA on Main Street next to Key Bank. And, uh, and this summer when the Main Lake Science Center is open, we'd be glad to, to host you and, and especially the dignified panelists. <laughs> Somebody get a half <laughs> You put that up there and then you duck down. Yeah. <laughs>